And then from there made my, my made my way state by state, covering almost every single state to the east coast to Georgia, um, to a city called Savannah, and then travelled over to um, Palo Alto, which is northern California, to Stanford University, before making a first option in New York and coming home. And why did I do all of this? Well, obviously the fellowship gave me a really really good opportunity to go to the U.S. and to really sort of. Um, I guess disengage from my responsibilities uh, in a safe way, in a safe space, and to carefully think about my own sort of um, sense of, you know, my attitude towards issues, my relationship with the, the wider world and myself, and four months really to immerse myself, it's quite a luxury, um, in, in uh, academia and intellectual rigour and also um, building friendships with 15 other people who've been selected from across the world. And I used uh, the two months after that as a great opportunity to, to sort of feel the pulse of the American nation from state by uh, state, city by city, because of what has been happening on both sides of the pond uh, since last summer. And I felt, you know, when I arrived in the US, it was at a time where the presidential debates were still ongoing and you know, it was mid-August and the election went until November. And so I felt like I was in a place where with some critical distance, because it wasn't my country. My, my country had already voted to leave the EU, and so I'd experienced enough uh, political um, sort of shake-up, if you like, for, my, uh, for the year. And I didn't really feel that I would be that affected by what happened in the US. And I think perhaps if the turnout had been different in, in the election, maybe I wouldn't have felt so strongly. But um, I really wanted to understand not only why I was feeling that way, but why why the American people didn't recognise each other in the same way that here in the UK, when we voted to leave the EU, we didn't recognise who had voted to leave. Where were those people? We were looking at each other, we were looking at our neighbours, our friends, our family members, and asking the question, did you vote to leave? And why would you do that? And I think in many, in many ways, I found similarities across the pond, obviously on a much bigger scale, with much greater impact for, for the world, um, easily. And so when the Americans also, at the time I was in a Yale bubble, and then later in a Stanford bubble, very liberal, very left, um, but even within those bubbles, the day after the election, uh, on campus, lots of students posted very simple A4 sheets of paper in big black bold font, love Trump's hate. And they pasted them all across the notice boards on campus in public spaces. And overnight, somebody went and set fire to one of them. And that's in a yellow bubble. And when I say a bubble, I mean, it's commonly known uh, for Yale to have a very uh, liberal left approach. Um, and so that scared people. There was also an incident where a group of men got into a small truck and drove around campus and went to one of the colleges where, went to the college that Hillary attended, Hillary Clinton. The Clintons both studied at Yale. And, uh, and started yelling obscenities and threats in the middle of the night to girls who were staying at, at the college. And so there was, although a handful of incidents, I think people would argue, but the fact that they could happen in that environment, in that space, just led me to become even more curious about who is America? What is America? Who are these people? How do they feel? What do they believe? Why do they believe that? Where do their feelings and their sentiments come from? How do they feel about each other? And so, I thought there's only one way to find out, and it's not listening to the media, it's not reading magazines, uh, it's not getting on Facebook and Twitter, it's actually going to see them, face to face, living in their communities, living side by side, and often I found myself living in their homes, and talking to them for myself, but mainly listening, listening to what they have to say. And so whatever conclusions you may draw from this, I want to share a few stories about 
what people share. I don't give away anybody's identities, and I hope to write about it in the future if I can. Um, but this is a little insight into how um, Americans in the South feel about others, but also feel about specific issues when it comes to religion and politics in the main. Okay, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read from a, a short piece that I've written. So I arrived in New Haven, which is in Connecticut on the East Coast, in the build up to the American election. I paid close attention to national conversations, to presidential debates, watched the election results unfold, and felt the nation split into extremes. I watched the Obama say goodbye, the inauguration of a new president, millions of people take part in street protests in the US and abroad. My circle of friends became increasingly diverse over these six months, something I feel really lucky to have experienced. As I lis listened to both the heartbreak and jubilancy across America upon the realization that Trump would become the president of the free world, I won't forget how one friend, a Southern Baptist who voted Republican, uh, she was actually the mother of a friend of mine, and I went to stay with them for Thanksgiving in Michigan, mm. and uh, not the Detroit, Michigan, a very different kind of Michigan, and I was really excited because I, I would never encounter these voices and these sentiments in my normal day-to-day -day life. I mean, you know, by virtue of who I am, not just, I'm not talking about religious labels, I'm talking about gender labels. By virtue of being a woman, I wouldn't be given access to some of these spaces on my own. And so I took the opportunity of a very generous friend of mine um, said, why don't you come and have your very first Thanksgiving with me and my family? And I thought, well, that sounds good. What's not to like? Turkey, pumpkin pie, um, and it was great. It was a wonderful, wonderful few days. And his mom, his mom and dad, I think, were quite taken aback by how uh, vocal and open I was, but also took advantage. So over over the Thanksgiving dinner and over many, many uh, different occasions in the in the subsequent days, they chose to ask me questions about my thoughts on on the media, on journalism, integrity, ethics around journalism, Europe compared to the US. Um, I was probably considered an expert in that household. And, and uh, my thoughts on what was going on in the US at the time and how I felt about that as a Brit, especially. And so she asked me, after we'd had lots of these conversations on the, on, on the day before I was leaving, and she was very warm, very affectionate, uh, Republican supporting family. Republicans, they would probably say, but there's a distinction in that they would consider themselves Trump voters but not Trump supporters, if that makes sense. So they wouldn't necessarily agree with all of his policies, especially some of the stuff around the wall and the, the, the sort of Muslim list, but they would definitely support uh, his ideas on abortion on, as, as pro-lifers. And this single issue voting phenomenon was quite common across across the South, as you might be able to imagine. So this Southern Baptist family that I was staying with, she said, um, <clears throat> she asked me to pray for Trump so that he succeeds in his presidency. After all, that's what they did for eight years for Obama. She perhaps didn't realize that praying for Trump to be successful in keeping all of his promises also meant building a wall to keep Hispanics out, putting Muslims on a list and having and, and the sudden mass uprooting of 11, 11 million undocumented people, many of whom have worked and paid their taxes in the US for generations. It was too painful to think about until we didn't continue the conversation, but she put her arm, her hand on my arm, and uh, I was quite fervent that we must pray for the new president-elect. A friend recently said to me that there are so many Americas, there are even thousands of New Mexicos, thousands of Texases and some Mississippis, and my journey across the South was intention to listen to and understand these voices and the diversity that makes America the great country that we know it is. So picture the scene. I'm a proud British Muslim woman, born and raised in Lancashire, very proud of my roots, by the way. I'm abroad, on my own, making my way from the west to the east coast, striking up conversations in my usual friendly line, Castrian way, with complete strangers. These months of traveling brought wonderful experiences into my life, the kind that stay with you forever. It also happened to be a time of flux and change in ways that I could never have imagined. So I was left with a sense of foreboding. How would people respond to me? I mean, given the national rhetoric, how would people feel about me coming into their spaces, into their diners, their restaurants, their coffee shops, um, on my own? And then as soon as I open my, open my mouth, I'm clearly a foreigner. I'm not, I'm not American. 
I wanted to feel the pulse of these people, and so I travelled across small towns, major cities, and several different states. I'd heard of the reputation of the southerners whose hospitality was very generous, and, and I found nothing less than that. I wasn't prepared for that generosity, if I'm honest. I was a little bit sceptical, and I didn't think people would take to me very well. And so I had conversations where I mainly listened. I didn't ask too many questions unless people encouraged it. In people's <coughs> homes, in airport lounges, on trains, buses. I was warned not to travel on the Greyhound, but I wanted to experience it, so I did so several times. Uh, <clears throat> it's not as crazy as Americans, as wealthy Americans think it is. Um, in cafes, in diners, and on car journeys that I ended up sharing with complete strangers who wanted to offer me a lift from one place to the next. And so we had lots and lots of different conversations, and most people would comment on how open they could be in talking to me about complex issues such as politics, religion, sexuality, equality, human rights, and all sorts of other issues, as opposed to their own families and neighbours. The risks of creating discord and arguments with their nearest and dearest persuaded them to refrain from talking about where they stood on important issues which were wildly being debated in political and media circles. At times we could appreciate each other's perspectives and enjoy our differences of opinion. At other times, however, my liberal values would rise up within me and push me to gently assert the importance of human rights for all people, family values that were rooted in modern day challenges and not in some abstract vacuum. Understanding climate change and the real life problems that we have in relation to the environment, environment and the challenge with religious ideologies that spoke of the other only in, ter in terms of eternal damnation. So if you don't belong to my group, then you're damned forever. Mm -hmm. After a Bible reading one evening, don't ask me how I ended up at this Bible reading, uh, in Austin, in Texas, the Pentecostal pastor and I chatted about how he decided what to preach on. And how he used his preaching as a means of uplifting his congregation. Before leaving that night, I asked whether in his idea of heaven, the ultimate goal for so many who, who have a religious ideology, is there room for someone like me? He was a really nice guy, and I respect him for taking the time to chat with me. His belief was clear. Unless I believed in the Holy Spirit to move through me, heaven was simply off limits. I told him that if on the day of reckoning, reckoning I was at the pearly gates, the pearly gates before him, and through God's grace was granted a place in heaven, I would come and find him wherever he was in the queue, take him by the hand to the front and ask that he also be granted a place. After all, this man had done his best to lead a good life and help others through difficult times, and which I, the information I gained through his preaching. He had strived, strived towards the love of God. Upon hearing this, the pastor was surprised and asked that we stay in touch after I left. Over dinner or coffee with families, with religious leaders and groups of friends, we were open about traditional values on women and men and how they should live their lives. And so many men I met were quite uh, in awe of the fact that I was taking this trip. I mean, who, who would have been? Take two months out to travel. Any one of us might want to do that at some point in our life, or may have already done so. And so I can respect the fact that people would think, wow, you're on a road trip. I wish I was doing that. In the same breath, a woman on your own? Really? And, you know, well, I know this talk is being recorded, but I'll still go there. So, um, on, a, on a shuttle bus from Salt Lake City in Utah down to St. George in southern Utah, seven and a half hour shuttle journey, a man sat next to me and the bus was full, there were no seats left. Really nice guy. And he was a little bit older than I was, had three grown up children, was Mormon, was a proud Mormon. And this is Mormon Central, if you like, and so is most of Southern California. Um, and so he, he, we spoke for the seven hours, and it was quite intense, and he chose to speak. And so he spoke about Trump, and every time somebody talked about politics, I asked them what their hopes and their fears were. It doesn't matter where, where I sit, where I think is their thoughts that matter. And so he said that he hoped that um, Trump would honor his promises that he'd made in the political campaign, and he would go through with things like the pro-life, um, well, about banning abortion across the United States. And we talked about how difficult that would be and how impossible. Um, 
But he said that's the only reason that he voted for Trump. Now, at the same time, he said, um, so, how old are you? Out of the blue. Well, that's interesting. Why would you be interested in my age? So I told him, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> and uh, he said, wow, okay, so you've only got a handful of years to have three kids. <laughs> he was more vulgar in his language than I did. So I quickly turned around and I thought, I said, why would you say that to a complete stranger? And he said, well, it's true, right? And I said, well, in your world, perhaps, but how can you imagine it to be true in my world? Like, I'm from a different country, I'm from a different culture, and my way of life is totally different to yours. And he then proceeded to give me a lecture on how women were placed on Earth as a vessel to bring the souls that were waiting. This is more than belief in terms of the souls that are waiting to come to Earth. And how a woman doesn't have a choice, but her job in life is to have children. Now, you know, I'm a bit of a feminist. And you don't even have to be a feminist. <laughs> and so we then had a long conversation about how uh, contradictory his sentiments were. On the one hand, he admired what I, of what I do and what I've done with my life. On the other hand, he thought that I should be living a different kind of life. And how he ought, he ought to reflect on that. And what, where does that take him? And how, you know, if this was his daughter sat in this seat, and a man his age sat next to her and proceeded to tell her in the way that he'd spoken to me, he was very polite with the content of what he had said, how would he feel? Um, and that this whole idea that it's my right to decide what happens to my body, it's not your right to decide, at which point we started talking about the rights and wrongs of the state paying for abortions and uh, he didn't want his taxes going to something that women use simply as birth control. And these were very common sentiments across the South. Mm. That this is not, <clears throat> abortion is not used as a means of dealing with a difficult, tragic situation. Not even in the case of rape. But one, if a woman becomes pregnant, she must have her child, whether she likes it or not. And two, that she owes it to God to do that. And when you start using the language like that, then actually you can go back and forth in your, in your conversation, in your discussion, in your debate. But if you're using religious ideology as a tool to sort of beat other people up with in this way, then actually I'm not surprised that, that Trump won because lots of people in the South vehemently argued that Hillary would advocate abortion until full term, something that is not true. Um, and that Trump would ban abortion across the whole of the United States. And when you're faced with those two choices, and you're Mormon, you're Southern Baptist, you're Evangelical Christian, you're Pentecostal Christian, along the South, that's the kind of philosophy that you want to support, that abortion is no longer allowed in this nation. And so whilst I would, uh, I would be apprehensive and fearful even of some of the other promises that he's, he's coming through with, I would love to go back and talk to those same people who then, at that time, said, he'll never do that. He'll never build a wall. I mean, it's just political rhetoric. He'll never ban Muslims. I mean, why would he do that? He does business with Muslims. He has trade deals with Muslims. Um, I have lots and lots of other stories, but I know that my time is up, and maybe we can talk about them in the Q&A. Thank you.